I kept my mouth shut for months now in regards to the NAR lawsuit and the changes that require now real estate agents to sign a buyer agreement before showing a house, as well as dealing with the commission side of the contracts on both ends, the buyer and the seller. By the way, in the United States, we're dealing with the NAR lawsuit, but also here in Canada, we've been dealing since last December with the TRESA changes. These changes, even though they don't affect the commission in Canada yet, they require mandatory signed contract for showing properties to a buyer. I've seen hundreds of webinars and probably thousands of posts related to this matter. And I would have not contributed to these thousands by putting together a free video for you but I received a large number of messages asking me how to deal with the buyer and how to ask them to sign a contract and pay the commission. And I'll be doing exactly that with this video. I'll be sharing with you the exact strategy step-by-step -step that includes the exact conversation, what the buyer receives prior to the meeting, exactly word by word when requesting the signature, as well as handling objections. And I'll add in there a very important component, dealing with an unrepresented buyer and how to deal with the seller in all of these three different scenarios. So let's dive in. So let's think first, what was the purpose of the lawsuit? And the purpose of the lawsuit was to avoid price fixing. They really wanted the consumer to have the choice. But guess what? They always had the choice. While many agents weren't taking the time to educate their clients, now they must do it. All we need to do now is to explain all the different scenarios and the choice is theirs. Now, here's the big opportunity here. Besides the substantial number of agents that are not willing to improve their skills and properly handle the situation that will come out of the business, now every consumer, with the exception of the ones that choose to be unrepresented, has to sign a buyer contract if they want to buy a house and they want the help from a realtor. That means there will be less resistance as buyers, they have no other alternative if they want to work with an agent. Alternatives that were very predominant before these regulations. Also a huge advantage right now is the fact that agents can demand higher commission. The best negotiator can demand higher commission right now. Where before there was this unspoken average percentage as an industry standard. I personally always signed a contract from the day one of being in real estate. And I can tell you with certainty after more than a decade of participating on professional seminars that high level agents always signed a contract with buyers and demand commission. We always signed a contract for commitment purposes and not to waste time with uncommitted prospects. And we demanded commission in case the seller would have not paid the commission, such as for sell by owner. Just a reminder that as a real estate agent, you have the duty to show your clients for sell by owner properties, and sometimes they don't collaborate with agents. Now, every state and board has their own regulations, so I highly recommend to contact your broker and board to confirm exactly what applies in your local market. For the purpose of this video, we'll be only talking about the representation and negotiation part of the business, not the regulatory part of the business. What I'm about to share with you are the exact steps that I take with every single buyer and every agent in my team follows this workflow and it's a mandatory standard procedure. It's a non-negotiable, no buyer agent in my team is allowed to work with any buyers without a signed contract. And I know you may want to say right now, well, it's mandatory right now, Andrea. Of course they do. Just so you know, I'm 100% sure that a lot of agents will continue to work without a signed contract. All the agents in my team and all the agents and team leaders that I coach, they follow the same standard procedure. It's meant to save time, work with serious prospects, and most importantly, protect everyone involved. A similar standard procedure applies to sellers where listing agents need to go over the commission structure. Let's first go over what has changed. Buyers must sign a written agreement with their chosen broker before touring a home, whether in person or live virtually. 
the agreement will reflect the terms they have negotiated with their agent, including what services will be provided, how much they will be compensated, and how. This is the same in U.S. and Canada. The listing broker or the seller may offer compensation to the buyer's agent, but there are limitations to how the offer can be marketed. Brokers, they can no longer offer compensation through the MLS. This only applies in U.S. as Canadians can still post on MLS the commission. If there is an offer of compensation to a buyer broker from a listing broker or a seller, the seller must approve the specific amount or rate of payment in writing, and that applies to both countries. Here's what has not changed in both countries. Compensation remains fully negotiable by the buyers and sellers and their agents. When finding an agent to work with, buyers and sellers should ask questions about compensation and understand what services they are receiving. If sellers have not offered compensations, buyers can request in their offer that the sellers compensate the buyer broker. If the seller is not paying buyer's agent compensation, the buyer will be responsible for paying their agent if they agreed in writing in their agreement. Seller can still offer and the buyer can still accept concessions such as offers to pay the buyer's closing costs. Huge confusion on this one, but buyers do not need a written agreement when just speaking to a listing agent during an open house or asking about their services. And agents who are realtors are ethically obligated to work in the best interest of their clients. Again, my intention with this video is to address the negotiation part of the process, not the regulatory one. Check with your broker and your board about your local regulations. What's my goal as a buyer agent? My goal as a buyer agent is to convert my value, to sign a contract, and ask for a commission to be paid should I fulfill my obligations and should the seller is not offering compensation to the buyer agent. As a seller agent, my goal is to convey value, get a signature on the contract, negotiate my commission, and ask the seller to be open to compensate potential buyer agents. Now, keep in mind something that it's super important. There's no commission to be paid without an accepted offer. In my view, the compensation is and always was to be paid by the buyer through the purchase for both the buyer and the seller's agent. Let's first talk about the buyer and then we'll touch on the seller. Here's the part that most don't understand. Asking for a signature is not a hard thing to do if that comes in place at the right time and the right circumstances. If you approach the buyer prospect from the first conversation and demand the signature on the contract, your conversion rate will be very low. Here's the buyer roadmap. This is part of the Listing Academy as a bonus. The Academy is my online course where I share with you all of my processes, my listing package, listing presentation, handling objections, the entire system that helped me personally close almost a half a billion in sales volume. In the Academy as a bonus, I have a full buyer sections where I go over absolutely everything, finding the buyer, pre-qualifying the buyer, objections, package, everything that you can imagine. But today, let's go over the roadmap of a buyer that will help us understand how we can easily actually sign a contract and demand commission. First things first is prospecting, whatever you get your client from, it doesn't matter, the process is the same. The second step is qualification. The most important step of working with the buyer is qualification. This is the time that you should be qualifying the buyer for motivation and expectations. And if this step is not satisfactory, I never move forward, which means I don't need to sign a contract because I would not be representing them. Here's why this step is so important. Besides not wasting your time with unqualified people, it helps you create trust report, and it's the perfect preparation for getting your contract signed. This meeting is when you're going to ask a lot of questions. And during this meeting, you will have a clear understanding if what they're looking for is unrealistic. This is the time when you're going to continue asking 
hypothetical questions such as, if what you're looking in terms of features and benefits and location doesn't come up in your price tag, are you willing to up that price or are you willing to move the location or lower the features and benefits? Or if you were to find today a property that really fits your budget and your desires in terms of features and benefits, are you ready to submit an offer today if you find that property? All of those hypothetical questions will help you understand motivation and urgency. Of course, this is also the time when you're going to ask if they have a pre-approval for financing. I personally don't work with anyone that just tells me that they have a pre-approval. They have to have either a paper signed from their bank or mortgage broker with the pre-approval letter, or they would allow me to touch base with their mortgage broker for confirmation, or they're using my own mortgage broker for financing. This is the time when you have to clearly ask them if they're working with another agent and if they have a signed contract. If this step goes well, meaning they have reasonable expectation, reasonable timing, and they seem to have the financial means, I move into the next step, which is getting the finances confirmed. At this point is where I mentioned that should financing go through and be confirmed, another meeting will take place for us to go over the paperwork. Now, when asking if they're working with another agent or letting them know that once we receive the mortgage pre-approval, we will have another meeting in regards to the paperwork, that's when they're coming up with objections such as, oh, we're working with an agent, by the way, but we didn't sign a contract, we were under no obligation, or we have a family member that it's a real estate agent, or, oh, by the way, we are not working with the contract, or we're not interested in signing the contract or so on. This is the perfect time where they're bringing up objections and you have to learn how to handle these objections. You will find less and less people resistant on signing a contract because if you want to be represented by an agent, you need to sign a contract. So it's going to be much easier now that everybody has to sign a contract, handle the objections, and then press for a contract. Now, some of them, regardless of how good you are at handling objections, they're going to say that they don't want to sign a contract, and that's fine. I once had a buyer that for three months was calling me and asking if I was willing to show them properties. And I had to keep asking them, are you now ready to go over the paperwork and get your dream home? I literally let them go to open houses, try with other agents before me. And after three months, they said yes. And we went out previewing once. We previewed five properties, submitted one offer, accepted, closed. And it was a $2 million property and my commission was $50,000. When you have the confidence to potentially walk away from $50,000, the buyers trust that you must provide a lot of value and you know your own worth because $50,000 does not impress you that much. The first rule of sales, never get attached to the outcome. Once you handle the objections and you revise the pre-approval confirmation, you conduct the second meeting, the paperwork. Now, I want you to keep in mind that only 10% of prospects bring up objections and only 1% are not willing to cooperate once you handle the objections. And that's the 1% that you definitely don't want to work with. Also, keep in mind that during this entire time, no listings are being sent to the prospects. And sometimes to get the pre-approval can take a long time. Do not send any listings or give any recommendations at this time. Also during this time, all interactions are over the phone and on Zoom. Don't meet with buyers until contract is signed. If you come to the point of setting up a Zoom call for paperwork review, be sure that you already have a signed contract because otherwise, they would not agree with that. A very important step is that between your qualification call and waiting for the mortgage pre-approval is to send them the buyer package. This is the best way to develop further trust and secure your signature for later on. 
And by the way, my entire buyer package is in the academy. Let's talk about appointment review and sign a contract. The appointment, it's a Zoom call, so you can actually share your screen. Again, I don't meet with the buyer until I have a signed contract. And by the way, by now, the trust is so strong that asking for a signature is just a formality. The commission side, it's a very easy and logical conversation. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, do you agree with me that if I find you the home that you want, negotiate on your behalf, I should get paid? Now, do you also agree with me that will be no commission to be paid unless your offer is accepted? Now, here's the thing. There's two scenarios. One, the seller compensate me for bringing him an offer to the table. In that case, you indirectly paid me through the purchase price. Fair enough? Now, scenario number two is where the seller does not compensate me for bringing them an offer. And that's when you have to pay me and the price offered to the seller will reflect that difference. You see, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, the money is always coming from you because if your offer is not accepted, there's no commission to be paid. Now, as a buyer agent, once you find the property that your client wants, besides the regular steps of making a phone call and asking the listing agent about the closing, about conditions, about all of the other due diligence, the Extra step that you need to do is to ask them if the seller is willing to cooperate and compensate the buyer's agent. And if they do, that will be reflected in the agreement of purchase and sale, and they will not have to pay you the commission. Now, let's talk about an unrepresented buyer. As a buyer agent, means nothing. You're not going to represent them. You're not going to provide them with value. You're not going to do absolutely anything. As a seller agent, on the other hand, by the TRESA regulation, you are not allowed to provide them with absolutely no information. But you are obligated to collaborate with their lawyer. When I sign a listing agreement, I have a clear stipulation of what happens in case we're dealing with an unrepresented buyer and the sellers agrees to pay me an additional percentage for that kind of service. It's not a full service, but it's still a service as I would have to deal with their lawyer. Now let's talk about how to deal with the seller. On a Canadian side, nothing really changed other than mentioning to them and make them understand what would look like if we would work with an unrepresented buyer. On the US side, on the other hand, things change in a sense that the seller is not allowed to advertise on MLS the commission. That doesn't mean that they're not allowed to offer the commission. So on my end as an agent, I would suggest the seller to be open to potentially pay the buyer's commission if needed. If you receive any value from this video, just leave a comment below. I would love to hear what was your biggest takeaway. And if you're interested in more sales video, just subscribe. It will mean a lot to me.